Hello and welcome to Art and Self. I'm Cindy Ingram, your host and the founder of Art Class Curator, the Curated Connections Library, and the Art and Self Connection Circle. This is a podcast where we experience the range and depth of what it means to be human, seen through our connections and conversations about works of art. These art conversations are here to show you that art is here for you as a catalyst, a challenger, a coach, and a comfort. Before we get started, take a moment to fill up your lungs with a deep breath. Connect with your body and your mind and your spirit and get ready to discover what art has to show you. I am so happy to welcome Allison Crow to the podcast. Welcome, Allison. Thank you. I'm excited. I'm actually excited. It's not the right word. That's so overused. I'm like nourished and curious and relieved to be here. Oh, I love in that. In your process. Yeah. I always say I'm so excited to welcome. And so I, I, today I said I'm so happy to welcome because I'm like, I realize I start everyone the exact same way. Right. But I am legitimately excited too. So it is overused, but also I'm excited. So before we get started in picking the art and talking, can you introduce yourself to our listeners? Hi, my name is Allison Crow, and I'm a human being. I'm a human being and an artist and a creative and a philosopher and a scientist and a teacher. And I happen to have a business being a life coach for business owners. I am a soul trying to remember who I am. And a lot of my life is wrapped up in all those things through work. <laughs> I don't have any littles. And somehow I have landed into a creative life and work that I get to play in every single day and also become a broader human. I don't want to say better because like if I never stopped growing 20 years ago, I'd still be enough. But I just, just here living this juicy life. And sometimes it's fun and sometimes it's awkward. And I get to teach and facilitate around that every day. Excellent. The one thing you didn't mention is that you're also now an author. That's right. I'm an author. <laughs> Isn't yeah. it funny? I mean, I'm sure some people, it's so easy to identify yourself in one way. And I just have so many facets of who I am. And yes, as of December 6th, I'm a published author. Oh, so exciting. So for your listeners, me and Allison are in many, multiple groups together. She's my coach, but we're also in the same writing group. We have the same book coach. And we were in another group together before all of this. And every time Allison would post on social media, every time I would see her talk, I'd be like, oh, she is me. <laughs> I was like, mm. she's like talking exactly as I think. And, and so it was really fun to um, like we have different personalities, but like everything you talk about, I'm like, yes, I also I also think that. So it's it's really been fun to be able to spend time with you mm. seeing your book. Thank you. Come into fruition so you can buy it now. We'll tell you more about it, too, at the end. But tell us the title of the book so that the title is Unarmored. Finding Home in the Wild Edges of Being Human. And it's really about, I don't know, the analogy I have today, it changes every day, but it's like, y'all know the container store, right? Like, and sometimes I love to go in the container store and it's very sexy, but I don't want to be one of those acrylic plastic containers as a human being. And I feel like I've been conditioned to be that. And there's so many pieces of being a human being that we try to escape, whether it's the really difficult stuff, specifically emotions, or being neurodivergent, <laughs> or it's the really good and joyful stuff. Like, I just feel like we're so contained and I'm, I'm done being contained. And so, yeah, unarmored, the wild yes. edge of finding home in the wild edge of being human. Awesome. We will, of course, put a link to the show notes, but, and I just got my copy this week and I just cannot wait to dive in. I flipped through it and I just was so excited as I did that, but I'll be diving we in. It, we had to make it good words, but I also wanted to make it visually appealing. Like I'm an artist yeah. too, so it had to be a colorful book and an artistic book. Yeah, it's amazing. Awesome. Okay, so let's get to the art, and then yeah, all of these topics that you mentioned will come up naturally, I am sure. 
I'm going to give you four choices. I will tell you the titles, but please don't pay much attention to the titles because I want us to really look at the imagery as we explore. And then just pick whichever one feels that draws you in, that makes you curious, that, you know, you'll know, you know, listen to your intuition on which one is the one. All right. So we have our first choice is Two Fridas by Frida Kahlo. And then we have Mary Magdalene by Shazia Sikander. Rite of Spring by Eileen Agar, and Dance of the Nine Opals by Ethel Kolkuhon. <laughs> I don't know if I'm saying that name right. I try to find pronunciations for these names and with contemporary, with artists that have not really been written about. It's kind of hard. Any of those really uh, draw you in? Well, like, did it, like, you know me. I don't, I don't have no idea what your process is for picking paintings, but... I'm already moved. I feel like I'm on one of those game shows. Like, I'm going to narrow it down to the first one <laughs> and the third one. Um, okay. I'll show you those that again. One. We're looking at Frida Kahlo, Two Fridas, and Rite of Spring by Eileen Agar. Yeah, that one feels like my brain. Hmm. And I'm going to, okay, so here's how I'm going to make my choice. This one feels like my brain, and it's really tempting to stay in my head. Hmm. And so I'm going to go to the Two Fridas. Okay. Um, awesome. Yeah, I saw this rainbow, and I oh, I could do I a whole like, oh. other episode on every single one of those, but definitely that one. Yeah, 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 that one. It does. Awesome. Okay, so let me make this a little bit bigger for us. I like that you chose because I I taught in your program once, and this was the one that I used for that because oh, I really? thought it matched your work so well. Why can't I? And remote? I almost was like, oh, I don't want to choose a Frida because everybody knows a Frida, and like, right, right, like. But it did make me cry instantly. Oh, well then, yeah, that, that's the one you should choose. <laughs> awesome. All right, so let's start with a description. So why don't you tell me first what, what drew you to it? What made that emotional reaction? Can you? Yeah, what the very what, first thing. So the, the two Fridas are there, but their hearts, they each have an anatomical rendition of their hearts and it hit my experience of having a heart attack recently which is no matter how much i try to deny it still pretty raw in me yeah and it also okay so that's not the description so right there's one frida is wearing white and lace and ruffles and she's also holding a pair of scissors and at the at the tip of some of these veins that come out of this heart and some of that is dripping blood on her skirt and she's so they're sitting on a bench and she's holding hands with the other frida and her veins are going from one one to the other mm-hmm. and I I can't see what she, the, the other Frida is wearing blue and gold and green and she's holding something in her hand, but I can't see what that is. The veins wrap around her arms, but her anatomical heart is there too. And it doesn't look like it's been operated on with the yeah. rare scissors. <laughs> yeah, it's and a little more kind of like red stoic. and healthy looking. Yeah. yeah, yeah, a little stoic faces, the usual Frida eyebrows and serious face and in the background is a navyish blue and white clouds looks like heather's sweatshirt (laughs) i'm like wait yeah that's (laughs) heather's sweatshirt our book coach wears this tie-dye sweatshirt often i'm like oh yeah it's sort of like gray bluish clouds but very abstract yeah, it's that Payne's gray that looks like a navy blue, which is one of my favorite colors to actually paint mm. with instead of using black and a lot of things. And it's one I start with a lot. And so I just noticed that, I mean, the wall behind me is painted that kind of navy blue, which is a really, it's a, it's just a really grounding color for me. Grounding is not the right word, but it, it provides the same sensory experience of grounding. Yeah. Like a soothing. Yeah. I'm fine. are holding hands. Yeah, so the additions that I would make to your description, I think you mentioned that the heart of the one on the left is kind of open and it 
you can kind of see the white, like almost looks like parts are cut or it's diseased or something, you know, it's, it's, you can see the in t- inside of it more than the other one. The other one looks like red and juicy and full. And then the one on the left is in this sort of frilly dress with a, like a lacy pattern on it. And it kind of goes up all the way to her chin. And it's got these like frilly sleeves. It's got embroidered flowers, but then the blood coming from that vein kind of looks like the flowers in part. Mm-hmm. So some of them you can't tell if they're the flowers or if they're the blood. Her complexion is lighter on the one on the left and darker on the one on the right. And her hairstyle's different on either each one too. A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. One looks like fancy dressed up and the other yeah. one looks like everyday, right? Like around the house versus going out to be. Mm-hmm paraded around the world yeah okay so where do you want to start what what really is calling you to talk about first i think the first thing that comes up is togetherness Hmm. and i know that i know that these are obviously the same woman and that this is a self-portrait but where i am personally it hit me about being with the heart of other people and yeah. having having that, I've been using the, this phrase lately, but being in the same electromagnetic space, right? The heart space. And we can be on Zoom and there's a lot of connection, but like holding hands with somebody and being in their physical presence of the energy of their heart is a big deal. And then the second thing is just the, in the white Frida, the one in the white, whiter clothes, that heart is cut open and some of the veins are are like a lighter red, mm-hmm. pink, gray, like dying, right? They're not full of nurturing blood. And, and it looks like that game Operation when we were little, right? Like yeah. if you had a real blood and gut operation. Yeah, and I just, I sent the damage to her heart. And how it's hidden. Well, it's not hidden really because we see it here, but Mm -hmm. right, she is wearing like this, I'm going to call it a performance dress, right? Like the public persona dress or, or, you know, what you would wear when you needed to look a certain way. Mm -hmm. And I noticed too, like the dress is on the one on the right, the heart is on top of the clothes. The clothes aren't impacted. Yeah. by the the heart at all but the one on the left it's like the heart is eating away at the dress it's almost like it's it's toxic or it's acid or so you know something like the, yeah. the clothes are just sort of disintegrating around it i like i just had this vision of like she of her like clutching at her own heart so mm-hmm. much it ripped her clothes away and it ripped her skin off and it like she just like did this yeah, this oh. own personal digging, digging and scratching oh. and peeling away. And so, yeah, the it's her like her bosom is shown under that bosom. I haven't said that word in like a million years. With her bosom. Oh, um, man, that's such a powerful image to imagine. And it makes me think, too, like all of the pain and stuff that we keep hidden you know the emotional pain the physical pain that it's it's there in us and then you would put on this fancy dress and we try to make our hair pretty and we just try to like put on this face of everything's fine but really like she's clawing herself like she's she's trying to like you know is she trying to be seen is she trying to be or is she like what is she trying to accomplish if she was doing that like that clawing yeah, trying I think to what comes, dig out the comes pain. up is that constriction, right? Like the, she's wearing this very constricting high collar lace yeah. around the neck. So I know, I can imagine, and I'm actually having a visceral, visceral memory of my first wedding, and I had tried on my dress a gazillion times. It was not up high to my neck, but it it did have lace on it. And when I mm-hmm. when I put that on the day of my wedding, I had an allergic reaction. And I've never had an allergic oh, wow. reaction to clothing before or since then. And it it like it was just so itchy to be in that lace. And so I can imagine that, you know, that in this image going all the way up her neck and like just get it off me, get it off me. It's so constraining. 
And I do see in myself and others so many ways we have been shamed and constrained Mm -hmm. by these made-up rules of what's okay, what's professional, what's good, what's bad, what's, you know, all the ways we're supposed to live life. And it causes our heart to suffer. Yeah. And it reminds me of what you talk about a lot with authenticity. And I think I might have talked about it on the podcast already. I can't remember which episode it was and what order these are in. (laughs) I think I did. Right. It was about the Gabarmonte authenticity versus belonging and sort of that. Oh, yeah. That clash. But it's that moment where we're trying to fit into other people's view of how we should be when we're really just crawling from the inside to like be who we actually are. Right, yeah, the 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 innocence of a child mm. that really doesn't know until a parent or caregiver unintentionally. You know, I don't think most parents wake up and say I think I'm going to fucking shame my kid. Yeah. I, I think I'm going to reject my kid, right? But when they're in there when the parent is in their reaction because the child is expressing, doing, feeling, whatever, and the parent subconsciously shames, blames, or withdraws, then we are put, it's like, oh, I don't, I I have this natural drive to be me, not that a little child would have that, but they're just being. Mm -hmm. And then, oh, I better not be my caregiver, my parent will unchoose me. Yeah. And yeah, I get the sense from the first Frida. She's also standing up straight. She's sitting up straight. She's yeah. sitting with an erect spine and the other one is much more relaxed, like a little hunched back. Not hunched back, but like just, you know, not having to sit like sit. Yeah. Through. Yeah. That's uh, how that's. Yeah, I can see that, too. It's a really subtle difference, but mm-hmm. it really changes the whole like vibe of of what mm-hmm. energy they're projecting. Mm-hmm. It's their posture. Yeah, I I sense some sadness in me, like I'm experiencing, like, I see this Frida on the left every single day in a million ways in myself and in my clients. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my people are pretty free. They're pretty expressed and that kind of stuff. But I just, but I also, right, like, I also see us recovering and repairing and healing and giving ourselves. I mean, that's actually what self-leadership is about, right? Like self-leadership is about restoring flow to the parts of you that we left behind, right? And so this is where like, it's not just another person that's helping Frida. It's another version of Frida Mm-hmm. You know, maybe she's giving her a transfusion, but here, but what I love too is like she's not this. Oh, this just hit. She's not doing anything, right? Like she's not giving her CPR. She's yeah. she's just sitting, connected to her through these arteries and veins, and she's just holding her hand, and that self connection and i say it slowly because you know that like it's just it's there's so many words that we hear every day and we just blow by them but when we really slow down and connect with the wounded parts of ourselves and i watch my clients and i watch myself try to solve a mental problem oh your heart is broken let me fix it let me do 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 right because we that's just those those things served a lot of us, right? I don't think you and I would have a business if we didn't have the ability to strategically and mentally solve problems. Yeah. But what truly heals is slowing down and being with ourselves. Yeah. And it's it's so powerful because it, you know, it I it's reminding me of both me as a friend and what I'm or and as a mom and and when people around me are struggling. And my first instinct is, okay, what can I do to fix this? What can I do to make you feel better? What can I do to change, to like 
ease your burden? What can I, you know, and it's, it's, that's always my first instinct. But that's also my first instinct with myself. Oh, I'm feeling sad. Okay. What can I, what can I do to, to make this go away? What can I, and then once I started working with you and you're like, slow down and ask that part of you what, what it needs. And most of the time it just needs to be like witnessed and seen and be like, oh, I see that you're there. And I see that you're sad and I am here with you while you're sad. And that that's all that it, most of the time, that's all that it ever wants and needs. It's pr- my presence and my attention. Yeah, we don't have a capacity, much less a reverence for discomfort. We're so in Western culture specifically, and I can't speak a lot to other cultures. That's what I've understood is that mm-hmm. Western cultures are a little bit more and especially America, like, let's polish everything up and let's look at really pretty and let's present this performance. And and we don't know how to, you know, funerals, mothers having babies, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, get you in, get you out. Like, mm-hmm. there's, there's no space and time. I, I remember, I can't remember where, I like to source things because I learned so much from other places, but somebody was discussing going back home to Ireland for their somebody in their family's funeral. And it was an article in a magazine that I read, like an actual paper magazine. And I I don't like this may have been years ago, but I'm having the visceral memory of looking at the yeah. magazine. And they were like, you know, you stand in a receiving line and you receive the entire community comes to this funeral and they all say something. And and by the time it takes hours, and by the time you're done, you've received the love of so many people, and it's kind of transmuted your grief, right? Mm. But in this society, we have shock. Oh, somebody died, and then I know personally, me, I'm not. I have disassociated from specifically funerals. I, I've the discomfort of loss so much and yeah. I've spent the last five to ten years learning but we don't know what to say to people or, or we think we have to say something instead of just being with and I'm you know I'm 50 years old and I'm learning the skill not just the insight but the actual muscle memory practice of being with the parts of me like this open and bleeding heart like this constricted woman and not jumping to fix it, but just being present with her. Mm-hmm. I think there's something also, right? She's the one holding the surgery scissors. I don't know if they're scissors or it's a clamp at the end of the vein, but it's she's a clamp. The, you know, yeah. the the quote wounded one is holding the tool. Yeah. And oh. We try so hard to hold the tools. But if we can just remember, and this is not about self-sufficiency, okay? So I'm not saying we don't need each other, but that we forget to see people as powerful. Yeah. And what increases, whether it's other people or whether it's ourselves, is our presence, not our fixing. But yeah, we were trained to fix. Yeah. Because people can't tolerate feeling bad. We built industries around it yeah i mean that entire that entire desire drive to fix is to make us feel better in the presence of someone who is suffering it has nothing to do with the person we're trying to help it's it's it has almost everything to do with like oh we we need to feel comfortable in this situation we need to feel useful we need to feel like we have value and I've, i've been there i'm on the other side of it now not that it's easy being uncomfortable but i've certainly i wrote about this the other day as like Oh, I know what it was. I know why that person left me. It wasn't because I would go, what did I do wrong, right? If my first husband Mm -hmm. left me and one of my best friends was like, you're too authentic. And -and so-and-so who had been like a client partner for years, then just one day just disappeared. I was like, oh, that also coincided with some space of my discomfort or like the edges of my humanness, right? Not the pretty shiny parts. And I trust myself to make, re- I, I don't expect myself to be perfect. I trust myself to make repair, right? Like, so if I said or did something, but some people that is so 
the imperfection is so uncomfortable and so triggering because they're so unokay with their own imperfection. They cannot be in the presence of that. Yeah. I couldn't be, my version of that is I was not able to be in the presence of loss, right? So mine was literally when somebody died. Like there were, there were, I would be at my family's funeral, but I remember various friends and I was like, oh my God, how did I not go to your dad's funeral? I'm so sorry. And I, I would like, I could, I could, I can look back now and see how I psychologically disassociated and got busy or, I remember one time a, a father that this guy that was a father figure to me I was a nanny for his kids in college. And then I ended up, they got me a job teaching at their kid's school. And after a long battle with a lung disease, he ultimately passed away. And I just sat in my backyard and could not make myself leave to go to that funeral. And it was selfish, right? Like, because I wasn't able to be with my own loss. Yeah. And I'm much more willing to be in the discomfort of my own loss, which makes it easier for me to hold space for other people's loss without trying to make them feel better. Yeah. So you mentioned when you were talking the the like the the edges of your humanness and that's in the title of your book too. Can you tell me what what that means exactly? Like do you have a working definition? <laughs> You know, the it's, edges I'm, are right on, right on. Like, I am starting to kind of write down some of these talking points about this book because, right, the place of me that thinks through things slowly and systematically is different from the place of me that has this like spontaneous, soulful writing. And the word unarmored came from a conversation at Camp Cultivate, and Heather was in the room with us, and she's the one who told me I said that. And while the edges of being human, and the reason it's connected to arm, an armored, and I know you didn't ask that, but like I can't talk about the wild edges of being human without talking about the protectors. Yeah. And the parts of me that are trying to protect me with benevolent intent from ever feeling pain again. And whether it's really hard, especially really hard pain or discomfort, they, they're trying, they have coping skills and behavioral mechanisms that kept me from being rejected. And whether I was a little kid or a quirky adult or doing you know, having tremendous joy or success, there were moments when I would sense around me that it was too much for people. Yeah. And it's not about breaking the rules, but I spent so many years trying to avoid my own humanness through positive psychology, through woo-woo spirituality, through law of attraction. I even had a piece of art once shared by P. Diddy and LL Cool J. Of cool. And it's like, <laughs> and it's a cute piece of art, but it's a word <laughs> art. But it says, right, like something about, it's something about be positive. And I'm, I'm like devastated because like P. Diddy and LL Cool J shared my art, but I don't believe in that message anymore. Yeah. I believe when I wrote that message, I was trying not to be all of my human self. And so the wild edges is, and the reason it's wild is because we're just contained to this, what's acceptable by community or family or people around us. And so the wild edges is experimenting outside of the container store and getting to know ourselves. I think we're told, I don't think, I know now, right? Like, oh, be authentic. That's become popular. That was not popular when I oh, first no. started just being who I was. But it's become overused and popular. And how on earth are we supposed to be our authentic selves if we don't know our authentic selves because they have been shoved in They've been shoved out to the edges as intolerable or unacceptable. And so, yeah, the last, I don't know, 10 years, I've been 
I've been discovering parts of me that have been there all along, and I've been discovering parts of me that, you know, that I'd I'd hidden away or was ashamed to show. So Uh it's about broadening our experience of being ourselves. Yeah. Something really fascinating was happening to me while you were talking. It does, this happens sometimes, but not a lot of times. So I'm going to try to explain this. But I think it was influenced by the art, which is really cool. But mm-hmm. you were talking about, so when you, every time I hear people talk about the edges of, you know, and, and you especially talk about the edges, I, I have this mental picture of like this energetic thing expanding from us. And then mm-hmm. like the edges in my mind, they're, they're usually like burnt. So it's just this mental and it's not even visual because I'm not really all that visual. It's just kind of an experiential thing. But I think what was happening, I was kind of envisioning this as you were talking and seeing how your definition was impacting my, my, my experience of what this means. And all of a sudden, like, I felt it have, like, heart veins from your, from your heart outward and, like, the nerves and the nerve. Maybe it was not veins. Maybe it was nerves. Like, it was nerve endings. That kind of go out, and then those are sort of sensitive and raw because they're 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 the edge of the things that can trigger you. And then you were talking about the armor, and I'm like, I was building this armor, protecting them. But then I was like, what does that actually do? I wish I could really fully articulate what just happened in my brain, but it was really cool to think about. Like, you know, I was always told, okay, to prepare yourself for going outside to build this bubble, or like pretend you're Glenda the Good Witch and build mm-hmm. this bubble around yourself, and that's how you can protect your energy moving forward. And then mm-hmm. that was in my visualization too. Man, I wish I was making sense. Um, I totally get you though. You get it. I'm like, I wish I had an instant <laughs> movie maker that I know. if I were having this experience, it would be showing you because I can't <laughs> verbally tell you I and can't. I certainly don't have the time and special <laughs> effects to unfold this in front of your eyes. So I can experience that. <laughs> Wait, it was really cool. It was really cool. And it reminded me of another artwork that I almost put on your list, which then I was like, oh, man, I wish I had that one at my fingertips because it was like, oh, that was in that artwork. Anyway. But what's your insight from that, that whatever just went through your mind? Like, what's your, what's your takeaway? Yeah, it was, the, the takeaway was that there are these, these parts of myself that I try to lock up, that I try to soothe, that I try to protect, that I try to, like, reinforce so that no one can get to them and no one can trigger them and no then no one can cause me pain. And then what I ultimately ended up at is like, well, what happens if I don't? What happens if there is not that protection there? And I allow those to like keep because they it, they felt like they were going out and they keep one they wanted to go out, but I was keeping them from going out. And then it made me think, well, what what would what would happen if I just let them go and let them do what they wanted? And that I didn't get an answer, but that made me like really ponder. One of my clients asked yesterday on a call, it was a group call, and she had, you know, said, right, like, so we were talking, well, we weren't talking about feel at all, but like, right, part of this work is about, oh, how do we learn how to feel the discomfort of either Mm -hmm. really good or really uncomfortable, right? Like, so some of us, we cannot handle the goodness, right? Like, our, our, our biology is just so used to the struggle. It has a muscle memory for that. So sometimes it's on the joyful and celebration and success end. And her brain did what many people's brains do. She was like, but if I allow myself to feel it all, then it's going to show up in really inconvenient, damaging times. And I think the example she used, she was like, well, then I'll be in a flooded and dysregulated state if I let all those little feelies go out there. And so our brain goes to either or. Either all these parts are armored up or they're completely unarmored. And so unarmored, that concept, not just the book, but the concept of unarmored isn't about not having armor. (laughs) It's not about stripping it completely away, but it is about learning the skills of leading these parts, helping them be in their right aligned roles, right? Because there are times we, it is very appropriate to have our protectors on, to have yeah. armor on. There are times when it's very imp- appropriate to pause feeling it all. And I used, it's like elimination, right? It's like peeing and pooping. 
<laughs> and little babies pee and poop in a diaper, right? But part of maturity is, is learning the muscle and the appropriate places to use the restroom. And then, yeah, sometimes we have, even as adults, right? Like I, I can think of a few times where I've had a really bad fever and I've woken up and I've peed in the bed, right? Like, and then as a 50-year-old woman, my little incontinence is not as strong as it used to be. I love me some poise pads. But in general, we've developed the muscles and the appropriate place to go to the restroom and eliminate, right? So same thing with processing emotions, right? Like our parents may have said, stop that crying bullshit or suck it up or get it together. They didn't say, we're at the grocery store. I believe you. I know you're frustrated. And, and how would a four-year-old even understand the, the concept of time? Let's go home and figure it out, right? So there's all yeah. kinds of stuff there. But what I'm saying is, and, and what I told my clients actually this morning as a follow-up to that was, don't let your brain trick you that it's either or. If you're going to go hiking, let's put on some hiking boots. And if you're going to watch walk on the beach, you don't want to walk with like ski boots, right? Like you can yeah. take the shoes in your closet for appropriate times. And each of these parts... And and so we're using this language, all that are listening, that comes from internal family systems, which is a modality that I, it's not just a modality, it's a practice. I saw that in my journal this morning, like this is not just a theory, this is a, a, a practice of being with ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so none of these parts are bad. Sometimes they're just in not the most helpful role. And sometimes... They just need to kind of readjust, but they don't know how to do that. And that's part of maturity as an adult is learning these skills is like, oh, now's not the time to be all over the place, right? Yeah. Uh, but then also one last little carry on of that analogy is like, God, isn't, isn't the ideal to be, quote, regular, <laughs> right? Like it's really liberating when you have regular, when you're regular and, <laughs> and what what would emotionally create regulation in us when we encounter difficult things is actually a regular practice, is actually, you know, that comes before the elimination. <laughs> the, the thing, right, right? Like the things yeah. that create a regular bowel movement, it's, that's not about the time that you go, you know, you just yeah. decide. It's about what happens on the other end. And so... I know it's about up there, but I go back to the two Fridas and I'm like, there's one of the practices is being with, being with in the presence, full body presence with all parts of us gives us a little bit more strength out in the world when we are tripped up or triggered. Yeah. Yeah. It's like I need to put on my armor when I, you know, go to a family a family event when I know that yeah, you know, that's I, there there's there's might be little little minds of triggers and it's like I need to be armored. But then and I, and I think that that's true is I tend to always have this black and white view that I all I have to be fully at peace. Or like if I'm not fully at peace then it's a it's a panic moment that there's so you know it's like there yeah. there are so many ranges of gray. Yeah, those absolutes really cause a lot of suffering. It's like either mm -hmm. or, good or bad. And I've really been making a conscious intention to use useful or not useful instead of yeah. good or bad, right? And I have a personal belief that there's no such thing as a negative emotion. I do believe we can have harmful behavior. Someone was like, what about the stirrers and their rage? And I was like, their rage isn't negative. Their behavior They're, of murder, the murdering, the, mur is a the murdering part is bad. So yeah, I'm with you, but it's not the anger because a lot of people experience anger. It's like this this thing about you know guns in schools, and everybody's like, it's a mental health issue. And I'm like, well, I got mental health issues out the wazoo, and I'm not even tempted to pick up a gun and go shoot somebody. So, you know, behavior and the source are are different things. So mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, allowing more more nuance. Speaking of the black and white, too, I, I was drawn into the sky right when we were talking about that and like the ranges of color in there. But every time I look at that sky in the painting, I always see it as sort of stormy or is not the word, but like the maybe tension. But 
I've spent a lot of time with this painting. Most of the paintings so far, or artworks on so far on the podcast are kind of new to me, but this one is the one I've, mm-hmm. I've spent hours talking about different groups with. And still, there's always new things. Like I, you've, you've had new observations that I've never heard before, which is so exciting. But anyway, the, the background to me has always had this sort of tumultuousness. But with our conversation today, I don't feel that as much, which is really interesting. I love how it, the, the painting And yet it's the same background me. you've always seen. Uh, and yep. perhaps it's your, gr- you've grown your muscle, your tolerance for weather, for stormy mm-hmm. weather, right? Yeah. And this, this is the thing. And, and we talk about weather as another analogy for emotions. And both we're both in Texas. And right now, I don't know if it's still raining, but the rain yeah, maybe you had this morning is now hit here. And yeah, my favorite days are sunny. I love a sunny day when I go get in the pool. But most of us don't go, oh, crap, it's raining. That's bad. Unless it's been raining for hundreds of days. And so mm-hmm. I do like, right, if it is stormy and it's okay. That's yeah. the wild edges of being human. Like, what if we, you know, it's not stormy. If, if you're thrashing in emotions in the dentist chair, you're going to have a hard time getting your teeth cleaned. I'm not saying it's either good or bad, but it's not right. Like we need yeah. to physically be calm. But I know I have been really hard when my internal world feels a little stormy. And just like the weather, another day, it could be crystal clear. Oh, I love if- that. I never really thought about that analogy with the weather. I don't think I have ever. But yeah, when it's rainy, I, it's like, ooh, I get to be cozy and I get to take more, like I get to be more gentle with myself. I don't force myself to go out into the rain and can do everything that I would do on a sunny day. I just, right. you know. And I where we to- live, the rain nurture, nurture, you know, like we yeah. need the rain here. It nourishes us. And so that's what I'm saying is that systemically and societally, and I have all these, I mean, that would be a whole nother conversation, but <laughs> right, like. All of this stuff has been pathologized or made wrong. It's been made a problem. And if our discomfort is a problem, then we will buy shit to alleviate our discomfort Mm -hmm. or we will relinquish control to an entity or else that may or may not have our interest, all because we don't know how to be present with ourselves because we're trying so hard to escape it. Yeah. And when we don't have to escape, what is very natural, st- internal storms are human. They are natural. They are not a moral failure. But that's what we've been taught. Yeah. And it has robbed us, right? So I know that sometimes like, right, like sometimes the work that I talk about or the things I experience or whatever I'm going through or even the things I share publicly, like, God, Allison, that's really fucking heavy. I'm not scared of the heavy when I can see it, when I can be present with it. Mm -hmm. And so I I love that, right? I love that perhaps it is still stormy and you've just been with the storm enough. It's not as volatile as your brain told you it initially was. Yeah, but it's really interesting, even though I have read book after book after book about emotion, even though I know, like, I can't escape emotion. It's part of life. I told it to someone in the Art Connection Circle last night. I'm mm-hmm. like, of course you have emotions. You're human. That You're going, you know, you can't not have emotions. I still, on days like yesterday, when I, you know, I showed up to writing practice yesterday, and I was like, I don't, I don't want to be here. <laughs> I, don't, mm-hmm. I forced myself to be here the whole day. I was just so grumpy. But I... I didn't allow myself, I didn't allow myself to be grumpy and I just shamed myself for it all day, even though I know that sometimes you just. Cindy, I teach this stuff and I've been teaching it intensely for two years and I've been learning it, you know, in very intense experiential trainings and I have been intellectually studying it. And it is, it is so easy to get cognitively, but our cognitive is from the neck up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I haven't actually seen i'll have to research this what does the nervous system look like from our neck up right i know that yeah. the, it goes up into our brain but really we're all the I, again i need to double check this because i don't know 
But usually the brain is connected to the nervous system. And yeah, there's clearly some nerve endings there. Back when I had surgery, I remember it took a few years to feel it again. So I know there's some nerve endings up there, but there are way more nerve endings in the bottom nine tenths of our body. And those nerve endings are biologically for the purpose of anticipating pain. Hello. And so if we want to escape pain, we and and our thinking is like, hey, this is working for me. Why in the hell? We don't have a muscle. We have a mental memory. Oh, I know this, but we don't have the somatic embodied skill set. This is not, and nobody's at fault for it. It's not a fault, but it's like, oh, this is a place where I can grow my physical capacity to sit and acclimate to my own discomfort. And when, oh, hello, part that judges me, I see you too. You're welcome to sit, right? Like imagine, so right, like, so here's Frida and she's bleeding out of her suffering heart. And then there's this part of Frida that is like, I'm here with you. I'm giving you my physical hand presence, like, right? And mm-hmm. we're just together. And then the judger comes in and tells Frida, you're doing it wrong. Is <laughs> she not allowed to be bleeding? And think about like all that disruption. Yeah. And, and I imagine Frida, the, the blue and green Frida with the whole heart saying, uh, I see you one that shames and says we're doing it wrong. Would you like for us to make room for you on the bench? I hear that you're concerned. I have presents to give to you too. Mm-hmm. Right. And trust me, it is easier for me to give myself physical pain presents than it is to give my overthinking part. I want to speak to yeah. one thing too around this that sometimes gets lost if I don't say it. For me, for this art, This work is never about eliminating or fixing these parts. And this is what I love about this painting. She is not slapping a Band-Aid on this part of her. And when when we talk about being in self, some of my clients are like, they start judging themselves because they're not in 100% self. And one of the things I learned in a training, it was like, if you can get 5% of self, 15% of self in the room, you can make massive healing, regulating strides. But, you know, we're taught in this Western society, it's like, let's make a (laughs) hundred, right? And in this emotional presence work, man, C's get degrees, (laughs) (laughs) right? There's, there's no grading. It's just a, it's just a gentle practice. And so I, I, I keep getting drawn back to these two connected and present with each other. And I'm not surprised I picked this one. Yeah, I'm not either. And it's funny that I, I, you would think that I would have factored your heart attack into the painting. <laughs> Didn't even cross my mind until you mentioned it. I was like, oh, right. But, well, right. Like normally I'm a big heart person. My birthday's in February. So when I was little, yeah. every, every birthday party was hearts and all this other stuff. And one of my logos is the little yellow heart. And I've been drawing a yellow heart since I can't remember. And I really wanted to gel- draw yellow hearts because everybody drew red. So I needed to be different. <laughs> but But what's interesting is recently, and I didn't even realize there was an emoji on the phone of an actual cardiovascular heart instead of just a little cartoon heart. And so since my heart attack in August, I am very present to my cardiovascular style heart versus the cartoon style. I'm very tuned into the blood and guts version of this intricate machine inside my body. That is not just a machine, but that she is so. So here, here is something really powerful that I learned from a cardiologist in a book called The Heart Speaks. And I cannot remember her name right now. It's on my Kindle. Someone referred it to me. But it's a book called The Heart Speaks. And I think the subtitle is like, How to Really Heal. And so because she's a doctor, she's got all kinds of scientific stuff. Some kind of spiritual practice was one thing, but the biggie. For healing heart disease, which is the number one killer, is community and being with our people. Mm. And if we can't be with ourselves, I mean, be so. And when I say that, it's like I need to be with my internal people, and I need to be with other human beings. Yeah, it reminds me what you said really early on 
about the electromagnetic presence of yeah. of people. And it, ever since you said that, I'm, ha- I'm having another like full body reaction to the painting, which I'm trying to learn to describe more as they happen because mm-hmm. they're they're there. But I was I I kind of can feel this the heart beating of the Frida on the right, mm-hmm. and like there's this you know steady healthy pull that's really comforting and then I, I can kind of feel it go to towards the other Frida and then you know they are holding hands they're, they're next to each other but they are literally connected the vein from one mm-hmm. Frida's heart goes into the other one and I can just like feel that very that slow steady Attunement. presence you know mm-hmm. that's slowly helping keep that other Frida you know, make her feel a little bit better or I don't know what it's doing for her, but it just like, it is healing to be in that. It's attunement, that right? Yeah. And that's what we did not get as kids. Mm. We didn't have, this is not about making our parents wrong. It's not fault, it's reason. But our parents didn't have attunement skills either. Yeah. And we now learn that attunement is really helpful. And yeah, we we need to be attuned with ourselves. It is healing. The the statistics are there. And we're living in a time where we're inundated with information and yeah, we have social media, but it used to be social networking sites. I read an article about that today. They used to be called social networking and yeah. now they're social broadcasting. Hmm. Right? So early it was literally about co- using these tools to connect and now it's become just another place to broadcast information. Yeah. Right? Fascinating. And 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 so I I notice and I think, you know, this is the way I teach and learn. I'm a more powerful teacher. I'm not saying it has to happen. I was once a coach for a mechanic. I don't know anything about being a mechanic, but I was a good coach <laughs> for them. But I so clearly see and i'm an introvert and i am awkward socially and there are times when i get overwhelmed being in groups of people and i my body and soul and mind need to be in the electromagnetic field of other people that i love and care about and who care about me yeah now i'm not talking a trip to target that shit i got my armor and my pink bubble on all damn day long <laughs> right? but i need in the best way, in the most healing cardiovascular, the heart speaks way to be with beloveds. It, yeah. It matters. It does. I looked up the name of that author so we can just point it out. We'll put a link in the show notes too, but yeah. it's Mimi Guarneri is the name um, of the person who wrote that. And then also... Me, the, oh, that ahead. wrote The Heart Speaks? The Heart Speaks, a cardiologist reveals the secret language of healing. Yes. Right? Okay. You're right. Okay. Yes. She's, a, she's an Italian American too. Okay. She like moved from it's a it's a great book. It's an easy read, even if you've never had a heart problem. I highly recommend it. Yeah. And but it also makes me think of, you know, when you have a baby, they say the first thing that you should do is put the baby on your chest because yeah. the baby is used to hearing your heartbeat and being a part of you and that it's really soothing to Yeah, it spends the first nine months that. regulated, right? Yeah. Not with information. Not yeah. with information. Oh. Yeah, they don't need to see you talking and smiling at it. They need to exactly. feel your your presence. Yeah. Oh, no. so I kind of dream of a society where we're able to be like this painting with ourselves and with others. Mm-hmm. I do find that my capacity to be with others. So my little joke is like the more I meet myself is the less I want to punch other people in the face. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> I've always been a very nice girl. But in the last six years, I have had a whole lot of parts that want to punch and hit. And I just have had a lot of anger. But the more I'm able to sit with my angry parts instead of shame them, the less I actually want to punch anybody. Yep. And so uh, this painting is actually a vision of, you know, it's, it's beautiful. Mm-hmm. It's colorful. It's textured. It's got ground and air and human and heart and wound and wholeness. And that is a world I dream of, that it's okay. And it, that 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 is okay. It is good, yeah. even though she's bleeding on her clothes. <laughs> yes. Well, I think that was a beautiful way to wrap up the episode. I think that really summed up. I know we could continue talking about this painting for another few hours. That always seems to be the case. But I love how 
it encapsulated all those things that I've learned from you and that that you talk about all the time. So awesome. So can you tell everybody how to find you on the internet, how to get your book? We'll put all these links in the show notes, but I'm going to hear it from yeah, you. Yeah, my home, my home base is Allison with two L's, A-L-L-I-S-O-N, crow.com. That's my website. And you can peruse and play from there. I love, I love Facebook still. I, I share almost every single day on Facebook and, and I share from my personal page, which I allow followers there. I share on Instagram. I share on TikTok. But the best place to probably start is my website. And then my book, by the time this is out, will be available on Amazon. And mm-hmm. it's, it is a full color book. So it's a little chunkier and a little, it's a luxury. It's not going to be super expensive, but it's not like a $9 <laughs> book. And I'll be, go ahead and be, I don't want to accuse myself of being greedy, but I'm like, if you buy the book, hey, also buy the 99 cent, 99 <laughs> cent Kindle. And that also helps me maybe get that book in the hands of somebody. Like I know a lot of people who love me and love my work and will buy that book. And I'm so grateful. But wouldn't it be fun if somebody out there has a broken heart like this Frida and could be introduced to some of these concepts that doesn't know that this stuff is out there? And so, yeah. And then we'll have a we'll have a link on my website too on alisoncrow.com. Somewhere on that main page will be a click to buy the book too. Well, thank you very much for joining me today. That was really fun. Thank I enjoyed you that very much. Having me. me too. Thanks again to Allison Crow for joining me today. I had such an amazing time with her during this hour. And we were talking a little bit after the episode, after I clicked stop recording. And I wanted to share some of the insights that I got just from that few minutes of extra talking at the end. We both mentioned, you know, her in the episode, how, you know, it felt a little cliche to choose the Frida one. And I was like, well, I almost didn't put Frida in there too, because, you know, she's so popular. And I, I really like showing different types of, you know, new works of art that people hadn't seen before. But I was like, but Frida Kahlo is famous for a reason. She, your heart is powerful for a reason. You know, she captivates people and she moves people. And Allison said, that I wish I could tell you exactly how she said it, but she was talking about how she wishes everybody had the same level of vulnerability that Frida Kahlo shows us. And it really gave me chills because showing our full selves, our pain, our discomfort, our inner turmoils, our passions, what Frida is so good at It's not something that a lot of people are really comfortable doing. And in really exploring topics like me and Allison's discussion today, and in all of these podcast episodes, and in in Allison's book, it's a way of normalizing feelings, normalizing that we are humans in this wide range of emotions. And Frida gives us that, you know, she, she's a great model for that. So I thought that was a beautiful insight from Allison. And I wanted to make sure I passed it along still after, even though we had stopped recording. And thank you so very much for listening. I have looked at this artwork again and again and again, hundreds of times in my career with, well, not hundreds of times, but with hundreds of students. And I learned even new things and deeper understandings about the possibilities that are present in this work of art today that I never had considered. So it was really powerful for me to experience as the person who got the joy of talking to Allison. And I hope that it was just as powerful for you to hear some of those thoughts and observations and interpretations. So again, if you have a insight about one of the works of art that you hear on my show, I would love to hear about it. So you can send me a Voxer message to Cindy Ingram on Voxer. You can also send me a voicemail if you call the number 202-996-7972. And you can also send me a voice memo to cindy at artandself.com. And I would love to share your insights about some of the art that we've discussed uh, at the end of the shows. So thank you so much. And I'll see you next week. 
Thank you so much for listening to Art and Self. And if you loved what you heard, please consider leaving me a rating or a review on iTunes. And share this episode with one friend who you know needs to hear what we talked about today. You will find links to the artworks that we discuss over at the show notes at artandself.com. And you can also join my email list to get notified of all of the new upcoming episodes. The videos of these episodes are also available over on YouTube at Art and Self. And you can also follow me on social media on Instagram at Art and Self and on Facebook at Art and Self Cindy. Thank you so much for listening and have a wonderful week. I'll see you next time.